Welcome to the Insomnia Project. These are the holiday episodes, as you probably know. We go to the 31st, and you're probably going to get one on New Year's as well. So let's say 32 days. I'm your host, Marco Timpano. Thank you for being with us during this holiday season. I have the sheer delight to invite back a dear friend, a fellow podcaster, an author, a academic, and um, just someone who's fun to be around. Let me introduce the host and producer of Getting Lit with Linda. Linda Mora, welcome back to the Insomnia Project. Marco Timpano, thank you for having me. We should add that you're my co-producer of Getting Lit with Linda, so it's such a pleasure to be on your podcast with you. I should mention that Linda right now is crammed in her closet because that's where <laughs> the best recording space is for her in Montreal. I'm in Toronto and I see Linda, a beautiful belt and some blue dress or some blue, blue uh, chemise, if you will, um, it is. kind of kind of in front of her. So thank you for cramming yourself into to your closet to, to make the best audio sound that we could for this episode. Anything for you and your listeners. Well, now, I do want to mention, if you haven't had a chance to listen to Getting Lit with Linda, it is a fantastic podcast. And I try to say that without a humble brag, without being, <laughs> despite me being a part of it. Linda, you do a great job with your podcast. Tell us Thank a little you, bit about Linda. it. So if people haven't found it yet. Well, uh, for those of you who have, are listening for the first time to my voice, the episode or rather the podcast is called Getting Lit with Linda. And so what I do in each episode is feature on or feature a book that I particularly enjoy, explain how we can relate to that particular book and even apply some of its insights to our daily life. And then I offer a takeaway. So another book that I happen to have read recently or remember as being particularly good. And I just want you to know about it. And Linda is a professor of literature. And um, I say that not because the uh, podcast is super academic, but because you have an e expertise in this and the episodes are under 30 minutes long. So you get that lovely tidbit about various books you may or may not have heard, interviews you've done with authors and people yes. in the world of literature, as well as fun little anecdotes that sort of coincide or dovetail with the book that you you happen to be covering. You've just done a better description than I could ever do about I, my own podcast. I doubt that. But now, because I have you here, I'm going to take advantage of this and have you talk about books that we should be reading during the holidays or during this winter season and books you would recommend. Amanda mentioned on yesterday's episode that she likes to read Robert Frost or she's reading Robert Frost oh, during lovely. this during this holiday season. Well, I'm a specialist of Canadian literature and Indigenous literature, so I'm going to have my own particular bias about the kinds of authors or books people should be reading. And we could go back in time and just pick up some fairly Canadian classics like Anne of Green Gables, a great read, even though it's considered children's lit. I'd read it now and I'd read it again. I remember reading the entire series and the Emily of New Moon series that followed thereafter. So that's an oldie but a goodie. Okay. And that's a great way, you know, it's it's something that's very iconic here in Canada. If you like this podcast and you're like, well, I don't know why I'm listening to this Canadian podcast, but I'm digging it. You probably really <laughs> sort of, you know, enjoy enjoy this book if you haven't already seen the multitude of television series and movies that have been made on the subject of this book, the author and her other books as well. I should tell your, your listeners that uh, the Anne of Green Gables series is by the author Lucy Maud Montgomery, and that the series is about this red-haired orphan who is absolutely charming and funny and whimsical and impulsive. She gets into all kinds of scrapes and escapades with her friend Diana, and so it makes for this wonderful um and as I say, charming read as she grows into maturity and adulthood. Oh, I hope to hear an episode on your podcast about this. And I say this because I'll be producing an episode of, on this <laughs> book for your podcast, uh, maybe in season three, uh, because I think it would be a great one to, to cover. Anyways, 
let's get out of my podcaster brain. What else, Linda? And let me ask you this. Okay, we're talking about books. What's your guilty pleasure magazine to read, oh. you know, when you're relaxing? Well, I can tell you that I just bought one recently. So uh, I'll confess my guilty pleasure is an L, Canadian L magazine. People don't usually expect that a literature prof will pick up fashion magazines. But what I do is I buy a copy and then I tuck it into the exams that I'm grading toward the end of the exams as a kind of incentive <laughs> to get me to the end of the grading period. So I just finished grading last night. You can be sure that I'll be looking through my L, Canadian L magazine today. Well, considering that you're, you're uh, podcasting with us from your closet full of clothes, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. All right. L magazine. I also, I, so usually I recommend to my own listeners that they pick up some of the um, the books that have had a lot of hype in the past little while. They may not have actually won awards, but might have been nominated for awards. So um, one book that I have in front of me is by Ivan Coyote. It's called Care Of. I started to read it just before the term ended, and I put it aside, not because it wasn't good, but because it was so exceptional, and I really wanted to relish it over the holidays. So it's essentially a series of letters that Ivan Coyote kept uh, that that were written to um, their audience members, their readers, as those readers wrote to Ivan Coyote. So, so Ivan Coyote is an author, and this is a nonfiction book. It's a nonfiction book. It's a it's about all of the different kinds of people who have reached out to Coyote at different points um, to connect with them, to try to have a sense of to, to send a, a note of at times identification or to um, thank Ivan Coyote for the work um, that they've produced thus far. It's, they're really, I'm not doing it any justice, but the letters are absolutely beautiful. I started oh, wow. weeping when I read one of them. It was about a, um, a parent who had lost her daughter. And so she reached out to Coyote because Coyote had talked about what it was like at one point, I think, to grapple with depression. And so, um, and also with coming out, I think, the, if I remember correctly. And so Coyote wrote, included that letter and the response to this woman. Beautiful exchanges, absolutely gorgeous. Thank you for that, Linda. I'll have all the books we mentioned, including Linda's podcast in her show notes, in case you're like, oh, I didn't catch that. Just sit back with your eggnog or your latte or your hot cocoa and just enjoy. I should have mentioned that earlier. Linda, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. For our listeners who may have someone like yourself, an avid reader, someone who might be a bit of a scholar when it comes to literature, uh, someone who just, you know, needs to read or loves to read good books. Mm. What books do we buy someone like you for the holiday season? Oh, that's such a good question. I think it's such a strange thing. People are reluctant to buy me books. That's and... funny because Amanda ordered a cake from a baker. And she brought the baker some scones and she said to the baker, she bought, it was a, it was a birthday, it was a birthday cake for me. She told the baker, she's like, I'm sure you bake for, for everyone and no one brings you baking. And she said, you're right. No one brings me baking because exactly there's, right. there's this sense of, I can't bring an expert baker something that I've baked because it won't be as good. So it's like, do I dare present a book to someone like you who knows more about literature than I possibly do. I know I would never get you a book, a Canadian book or an Indigenous book. I might get you something that is from my world. Uh, but I'm just curious, what kind of book do we get you or someone like yourself? First of all, allow me to say, yes, you absolutely could buy me a book or a Canadian book, and I would be thoroughly delighted. And even if I've read it, I will read it again. So um, my partner's son bought me a couple of years ago, Margaret Atwood's Testaments, which you would have thought that I had already owned and read, but I had not own, read it and I did not own it. And when he gave it to me, I gulped it. I went right through it in a day. 
It was so fantastic. I, I love The Handmaid's Tale, but I thought Testaments was even better. So for readers, or rather for your listeners who may not know, they most certainly know, I'm sure, Margaret Atwood. She's now become an international icon. But um, And they may even know about The Handmaid's Tale, which is this kind of dystopian look at what happens to the United States. The Testaments, or rather just Testaments, is a kind of sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, and it tells us what actually happens to the main character. It um, There's a kind of ambivalence or ambiguity about what happens to the main character right. in The Handmaid's Tale. Well, The Testaments takes up that story and tells us what happened thereafter. Well, let's go back to my original question, Linda, because you're you're wiggling your way out of answering. <laughs> I am <laughs> wiggling. <laughs> What kind of book do we buy someone like yourself? If our listeners are like, I want to buy my Aunt Helen a book. I want to buy my neighbor Bob a book. I want to buy the mailman who reads or the mail carrier who reads a book. I want to buy my bar- my favorite barista their favorite or their a book for them. What book do, how do we go about doing that? So for me, you just said you would accept Canadian books. So I would look up on the inter- internet, mm. obscure Canadian books that are excellent <laughs> and see what comes up. But, but what you just want, you just want anything. It sounds like any, anything yes. with pages, you would be happy to read. Well, not anything with pages, but I, I think it's a misconception um, that I've read everything. It's extremely difficult for a professor of especially a contemporary body of literature, so in my case, Canadian literature, to keep up with everything. So I'm often delighted by um, by gifts of books by contemporary writers that have just been published in the past couple of years because there's no way that I've read all of them. So recently I did read uh, Zoe Wittal's Spectacular. I got my hands on Shawnee Mutu's uh, Polar Vortex, which I've still yet to read. That's on my Christmas list. Um, I have, as I say, Ivan Coyote's book, and I also ordered and would recommend, I'll come back to your question though, Marco, in just a minute. I also ordered and would recommend Thomas King's Borders, which is a graphic novel. Oh, okay. But that doesn't mean that there are books out there that I've clearly, I must have read everything. No, I'm so thrilled to get, for example, the books of writers who have been shortlisted for a prize or who made it to the long list of a prize that I've not yet been able to read. I just, I have my favorite authors and I would love to get any book by them as an, as one example, or really any book by a contemporary author. What if I bought you Jackie Collins's book, Stud? (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's it's a salacious book. It you know it, it is not necessarily holiday related, but uh, probably is not in your collection. No, it, it's not. It's uh, if you actually got me that book because you had read it and loved it, then I would be delighted by such a book. You're right, it, though it's not part of my collection. I've uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to have it part of my collection. I, I have all kinds of books on fashion on my bookshelves too. So it it really is about what people like okay. and then what they want to give me. As another quick example, a student of mine, a very a very intelligent student about about whom I feel uh, very proud actually. This student bought me a book by Donna Tart, which I've not yet read. And they explained to me why they liked it. And uh, inscribe the book to me, and I will now most certainly read that and treasure it too. Okay, okay, yeah, because you might not necessarily love the book, but you love the fact that someone's sharing something that they enjoy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You have it. Exactly. That's wonderful. That is actually a wonderful way to look at any gift giving, right? Yes. Send you know sending something from the heart sometimes yes. can be can be the most beautiful thing. And I would also say, okay, Linda, correct me if I'm wrong. Here are some great gifts for book lovers. And then any insight you get from what I say, please correct or adjust what I've said. All right. If that makes any sense, because it doesn't make Mm -hmm. sense to me. Sometimes things just come out of my mouth. And as they come, I'm trying, (laughs) I'm trying to figure out what I'm saying. Okay. 
I've got a difficult book buyer, or I've got a difficult uh, person who enjoys books on my list mm. that I want to buy for. Her name mm -hmm. is Linda. And I'm thinking, <laughs> send a beautiful bookmark, perhaps one that I've made. In May, I've taken the Lily of the Valley's flowers from my front. I've pressed them in a book, and now I've put them in a bookmark, and I've wrote, enjoy this. You drive me crazy. Love, Marco. <laughs> and I mail it to you. You get a bookmark. What are your thoughts on that? My first thought is, I'm so delighted that Marco thought of me. Perhaps not in that way. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But I'm, I keep, I actually keep things like that for years and years. I, yeah, um, your, your listeners will not know that we have a friendship that goes back decades and that I had, I had found um, a Christmas card from you from I think 20 years ago which I kept right so really that kind of thing I find very touching and I, I make a point of not only using it but making sure that I keep it and treasure it you're also an archivist so that needs to be said or an archivist <laughs> so would um would you know that that paper that doesn't that doesn't acid-free paper, acid -free paper. Of, if I send you a bundle of that would that be great under your tree well, um, <laughs> doesn't sound like it. All right. Uh, it would be less meaningful. It would be practical okay. because I do use acid free folders. I see. I'm not properly an archivist. I have archivist tendencies. I love, oh. I love archivists, but I've studied archival theory and, um, ar uh, archival preservation. So for my own papers, um, documents that are important to me i do have them in acid free folders in acid free boxes but what, what if i sent you my my bookmark in an acid free box with acid free paper <laughs> wrapped in acid free gift wrapping paper or or christmas paper i'd say that that's a fairly special gift <laughs> <laughs> um, didn't you write a book about archiving linda I did. I wrote okay. two, actually. Okay. Can you tell us these books? Because I feel like I'm just, I'm just, you know, making fun of everything and, and sure, you, no, you're no, quite accomplished. No, 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 not at all. Um, so one of them was called Unarrested Archives and the other is called Moving Archives. So Unarrested Archives was about five different Canadian authors. Well, actually, one of them is properly Indigenous, um, Kenya Gahaga specifically. And um, how these women figured out or determined how they should preserve their papers. And I looked across the 20th century to show how those practices changed over the centuries, or rather over the century, because these women um, had different means or techniques available or resources available to them throughout the century. And so it became clear by the end of the 20th century that they had greater independence and that women were more respected as visible citizens, if you will. In moving archives, I looked at how we really imbue our archival papers with a kind of affect, with emotion, and that, that those papers, when we move them from one location to another, actually take on different affects, different meanings. They take on different importance. So I looked at, at the pun of moving, right? the idea of something that touches us, but that's something that also moves and shifts over time and, and uh, in different places. Now, you mentioned this Indigenous book. I, I haven't read a great deal of Indigenous books. I've, mm. I've seen some Indigenous plays, and I do listen to some Indigenous podcasts, mm. including uh, stuff from my friend Ryan McMahon, Think Indigenous, Red Man Laughing, oh, cool. Stories from the Land. These are all Indigenous podcasts I listen to. But mm -hmm. could you recommend an Indigenous book for someone like myself who might be listening, who's never really picked up an Indigenous book as a book, a good book to read as their first book from an Indigenous author? Well, um, my favorite book of all time from an Indigenous author is Eden Robinson's Monkey Beach. I may not recommend that one to you, Marco, in particular, but I think okay. many of your listeners would love it. Okay. Um, it was recently made into a movie, um, and then she also has a trickster series that came out after that. But I really do think Monkey Beach, the novel, is superior. It's so, oh, it's 
so evocative. It's so well written. It's complicated. It has all of these rich and sophisticated layers to it. I highly recommend it. Um, she's a Heisler a Heltzik writer, I should say. Uh, I would also recommend um, Sherry Dimeline's The Marrow Thieves, which is a dystopian sci-fi novel and also just exceptional. Um, it, the ending, I think, may be in some way, it's in some ways it's really, really good. In some ways it's been critiqued by others, but I think it's just a, it's a good read um, and will give a, a more visceral sense of, of Indigenous history. Um, so that is, it's not, it's not a literal history of the Indigenous because it's dystopian. It's located in the future. I see. But it encapsulates viscerally what happened to them in the past. That's how largely dystopian fiction works anyway. It takes elements of the past and injects them into the future. So um, a third book I would recommend is the one that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, Thomas King's Borders. Um, he's a Cherokee Greek writer, and he um, it's a graphic novel that's been developed from a short story called Borders that comes from a collection called One Good Story, That One. And so the title encapsulates the kind of colloquial oral tradition that's um, inter uh, intermingled with the writing of the text. But in Borders, he's looking at this um, Blackfoot woman who is taking her child with her across the border and when she gets to the border they ask her to identify her citizenship and she says blackfoot but her op that's not an, considered an option her options are canadian uh -huh. or american and so the rest of the story that unfurls is all about the complications that arise with her trying to get across the border by declaring herself blackfoot oh this this book sounds right up my alley it's great. It's oh. funny and smart. It's really, really good. Linda, thank you. My goodness. Like, I feel like I have so many books to choose from just talking to you here. It's every time I talk to Linda, I'm like, I, your last episode, I was like, oh, Linda, I think I really want to read that book. And you're like, yeah. Oh, that's... yes. The Richard, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Marco, but yes, no, the please. Richard. The Richard Van Camp uh, collection, I should also add, I love this book. Richard Van Camp is a Dene writer. And so that collection of stories is called The Moon of Letting Go. Um, and it's this quirky, funny, smart book. He focuses not consistently, but quite a lot on masculinity and on male friendships. It's so, so wonderful. Really, really good. And if you want to know more about that book, listen to uh, Getting Lit with Linda, the latest episode um, where, where you cover that and uh and and introduce me to that book and i can't wait to pick it up i love libraries i love to pick up um things from the library how about a lovely book carrying bag from a library would that be a good gift for someone like yourself like like say it the would, seattle library be... yeah <laughs> it would be excellent that would be okay. wonderful yes okay. that's another good gift so bookmarks book bags what else can I get you in your stocking? <laughs> just really that just that that bookmark that you had made and mm -hmm. or a book. Perfect. Love it. I'd be delighted by those. Could I and take an, and an inscription in the book? Could I take the Christmas card I got from you this year? Cut it up. <laughs> make a bookmark out of it. Write Merry Effin Christmas and send it back to you next year for Christmas. And would you know that's the that's the postcard you sent me? Um, I probably would. <laughs> I'd be puzzled by that gift. <laughs> Guess what you're getting next year? Oh, <laughs> Linda. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I, I know you have a whole list of books that you prepared. What else did we not cover in that list as I took you down bookmark lane? Uh, I think really we, we've we covered a, a, a slew of really good writers, right. but one of my favorite writers has to still be, well, actually I'll, I'll pick two as a, my parting, um, my parting Pick as many uh, as you want, Linda. It's a holiday episode. There's no rules here. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll, what I'll do is name some of my favorite okay. writers, and I'll suggest that you go out and get any of the books by Great. these writers. So here we go quickly. Um, Madeline Tian, um, um, Shani Mutu, 
Rawi Haj, Thomas King, Alistair McLeod, again, Richard Van Camp, Lisa Moore, uh, Michael Redhill, um, my goodness, who am I missing? David Cheriandi, um, uh, M. Norbezi Phillips, she's a poet. Um, uh, I think that should be at least about 10 writers in there that I would su strongly suggest. Always, of course, Margaret Atwood. Um, and um, I'm going to say a couple, Linda. Okay. Bill Bryson, one of my favorite writers. Okay. David Sedaris, if you need oh, a laugh. Yeah. If you David need a, Sedaris. Yeah. If you need a laugh, definitely, or listen to his audio of him reading his book, his audio books. Fantastic. Louise uh, Penny. Louise Penny just wrote a book with Hillary Clinton, correct? Exactly. That Louise uh, Louise Penny would be a great recommendation if if people were inter interested in mysteries. Oh yeah, I hear she's a great mystery writer and she's Canadian as well. Exactly. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, Linda, I think that's a I think that's a quite an expensive list and I know what's going <laughs> to happen. Linda's going to text me in about an hour and say, "I forgot to mention this person. I forgot to mention that." That is going to happen. Totally going to happen and that's fine. You know what? They didn't make the list. Maybe they were on the lot naughty list, so their books didn't get <laughs> mentioned this year. <laughs> Linda, do you have any I have to ask a couple of questions that I've asked all my guests for the holiday episodes. One, do you have any special ornaments on your tree? I actually don't have a tree this okay, year. Okay. Do you have a favorite holiday or Christmas carol? Oh, yes. I love Silent Night. Okay. Okay. And uh, Linda, I just want to wish you all the best for the holidays and a happy new year and all the best with your podcast. Thank you, Marco Timpano. Thank you for having me. I wish you all the best. Happy holidays to you and Amanda. I just... I'm so grateful for our friendship and for the chance to speak today. It's really uh, been wonderful. Thank you, Linda. Linda actually drove like pretty much all night. And I said to her, listen, if you can't make the podcast happen, it's all good. And she says, if there's one thing I'm going to do today, it's I'm going to make the <laughs> podcast happen. So thank you, Linda. For everyone you, else, Marco. let us know what books you like to read over the holidays or recommendations that you have. And I'll be sure to put them on our social media. So just reach out to us on Twitter at Listen and Sleep, Instagram, The Insomnia Project, and of course, Facebook or however else you want to reach us. We're happy to receive it. Until tomorrow, we hope you were able to listen, enjoy, and maybe even sleep. <laughs>